the Village of Lake Bluffs Finance Committee meeting. Do we have a roll call of everybody who's here, or do you have that, Marlene? Yes, I have everybody. Okay, great. Um, so the first thing uh, on the agenda is the um, approval of the minutes from the March 9th, 2020 Finance Committee meeting. Do we have a motion? Trustee uh, yes. Anchorman, can I hit the pause button really quickly so yes. that Village Attorney Freeman can make a statement with regards to how we're meeting in this manner? Sounds great. Thanks. Can everybody hear me? Yes. 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 So as before, we're um, meeting tonight remotely um, in reliance on the governor's executive order of March 16th that was extended in April 1 to suspend the provisions of the Open Meeting Act that allows you all to meet remotely without being physically present. Um, the reason I wanted to restate that is um, about now an hour and 15 minutes ago, a state court judge in Clay County um, issued a temporary restraining order against um, Governor Pritzker's March 20th stay at home order. Um, it was filed by a downstate representative um, challenging the governor's authority to continue the stay at home orders in light of a statutory provision that says that emergency declarations are only supposed to be for 30 days. Um, there's a couple of, um, we, we believe that we can still proceed based on the governor's suspension of the Open Meetings Act for a number of reasons. One, the judge downstate did not enjoin the suspension of the Open Meetings Act or the order in which it was contained. He enjoined another order. Two, um, the downstate order was solely directed at one person who filed the complaint. It doesn't enjoin um, all public bodies from holding public meetings under that provision of the suspension. Um, and three, Governor Pritzker's already announced in his press conference that he will be appealing. And so until we get a final ruling from a appellate court of the Illinois Supreme Court, um, we think um, that we are properly still operating in reliance on the governor's March 16th order. So I'll repeat that again at the beginning of the regular meeting at seven o'clock, but I wanted to put that on the record for you all tonight. And I can answer any questions um, that you might have. Okay. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Thank you. Okay. You know what? I, I do have uh, one quick question, Peter. I assume if we, we, we are gonna proceed, but if, um, if that's, if that's, uh, order is not is, is if his appeal has failed does that make anything that we do tonight assuming we proceed null and void well i don't know if we'll be in the, at least in finance committee um we won't probably won't be taking any final action that binds the village in the regular meeting any i any if it is declared and i i would say that this is incredibly unlikely um if it is declared that the somehow the suspension was improper of the Open Meetings Act, um, at most what would happen is the court would rule going forward, you have to have a quorum physically present. The Open Meetings Act really doesn't even authorize judges to strike down final actions, except if those final actions are taken illegally in closed meetings, you know, executive session. There's really not authority to strike down actions that we take in open meetings. So at the most, I think what would happen is it would say prospectively, we have to start meeting in person. So okay, Peter, uh, this, this is Bill, as a follow up on that, I know that we have on tonight's full agenda uh, for the village board meeting, uh, some approval of budget for which I know there's deadlines mm -hmm. that function. You are confident, Peter, that those wouldn't be considered, um, what's the legal term, ultra virus in any way? Yeah, I am. And in fact, the one of the um, we drew, I don't know if I forwarded this to everybody, but we actually wrote a memo um, um, with our analysis of why the governor's suspension of the OMA is authorized under Illinois statute. And one of the things we said was, even if you and which is what I was saying to Trustee Toll, even if you find that somehow he didn't have that authority, the courts don't have authority under the Open Meetings Act to strike down final action taken in open session. The only time courts are 
um, authorized to strike things down as ultra vires or as illegal is if they're taken in closed session. So that, so not for that reason and for the practical reason, there are thousands of public bodies around the state holding public meetings. I find it not possible that a court would strike down every final action that those public bodies have made over the last month and continue to make this month. Very well, thank you, Peter. Okay, is that it for questions? Okay, getting back to the agenda. Next, we have the approval of the minutes from the March 9th, 2020 meeting. Do we have a motion? So moved. Do we have a second? Second, okay. second. Uh, any discussion of changes, corrections, updates to the minutes? No. Okay, hearing none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Uh, next, we have um, an opportunity for non-agenda items. Um, and if anyone would like to speak on something that is not on the agenda, the Finance Committee will allocate 15 minutes at this time. For anybody who would like the opportunity to address the committee, uh, Glenn or Drew, do we have anyone queued up? Uh, we have no emails that are for items that are, no emails have been submitted for items that were not on the agenda. Glenn, I don't think there's anybody participating looking to speak at this time. Uh, it does not appear so. Again, um, if you are uh, tuning in on a TC at the bottom, there's a Q&A tab you can use if you'd like to be recognized. If you're on the phone, which I don't think anyone is, you could dial star nine. Okay, we'll leave a moment to see if something arises. Okay, hearing, hearing nothing, um, let's move to the next agenda item. The uh, item of business is a discussion regarding um, a local stimulus grant program, uh, a potential to have Lake Bluff um, participate in uh, some action that would demonstrate support for the local business community. Um, and we have a memorandum that was presented to the Finance Committee and Kathy uh, from Drew and Bettina that uh, looked at some potential structures and also um, what other local municipalities have done. And uh, hopefully you've had an opportunity to kind of look at that. Um, Bettina, do you have a summary that you'd like to present or drew was there no i, I think uh, bettina does have a brief presentation okay she can walk mm -hmm. everybody through this and um then we, we certainly can answer any questions you may have and i think there's a couple callers on the phone that would like to participate uh, i did receive two emails um uh, on the same topic as well so you know okay so we'll proceed with the presentation first and then the comments from the public at your pleasure. Okay. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so without a doubt, the coronavirus is having a significant impact on business. Thousands of businesses have closed or significantly cut back on their operations, and COVID closures have had an impact on revenues and employment. On this slide, if I can click. Uh, Bank of America's recent data presents a linear view of the aggregate effect on credit card spending comparing April, February of February through April of 2019 through 2020. You can see um, the decline in credit card charges and sales. Business assistance programs have been offered both federally and locally. Um, everything ranging from paycheck protection, as you've all probably heard about, small debt relief programs, which have been just reopened for small business loans, and community recovery initiatives, which include um, Cook Counties, and also some local initiatives that were outlined in the memorandum with regards to the Village of Wilmette, with um, 
their budgeted stimulus program of 375,000 for sales tax rebates. Uh, City of Lake Forest with a $287,000 proposal. Um, and there's also been uh, tax credits related to payroll. These fundamental, um, the fundamentals of the strategic plan directly correlate to the planning and commitment of resources to the community. And this grant program, program represents that. Oh, I see my slide is missing a uh, little percentage there. Sorry. Um, the blue pie that's missing the data is the municipal tax at a 2% rate. So that 2% rate uh, represents 1% of home rule and 1% of the municipal tax that we receive as a portion of the state, or as a portion of the total 8% of the pie. Um, this represents the various types of businesses based on SIC codes from 2016 to 2019 and their portion of the sales tax returns. And this is just for Lake Bluff? This is just for Lake Bluff based on category mm -hmm. to show um, everything from automotive to agriculture to, you know, food and beverage, drinking and eating, mm -hmm. um, and some small apparel that's not really there, but it's a small amount. So the local business um, stimulus program that we presented in the memorandum, the criteria um, would be that applicants are reporting sales tax locally. Um, they're not to be part of a franchise, a private club, or a home occupation. They're to be located in CBD, L1, L2, AP1, or S zoning districts. They can have no more than four operating locations. They must have been in operation on March 21st, 2020. And applicants must have um, suffered a minimum of a 25% decline in revenues. Applicants must have paid an annual total minimum of $500 in sales tax during calendar year 2019. And the qualified applicant may receive a 10% rebate on their sales tax payments. With, so that would be a minimum of $500 and a maximum of $5,000 for that rebate. Administratively, um, this would mean that we'd process an application um, which would also lead, uh, which would require W-9, a copy of their March or April S T1 tax returns to the state to demonstrate a minimum 25% decline. Um, copies of um, the state forms from January 19 to December 2019 to confirm the qualifying amounts. Um, and what would this look like for a typical applicant or not typical, but for a filing? So we'd look at the, if they return their March of 2020 and their March of 2019 tax returns, we'd look at line 25 which are the taxable payments. In this example, uh, $100,000 was paid in taxable receipts in 2020 and in 2019, 130, which would show a 23% decline or ineligibility. So then we would look at the April filing periods for the respective years. Um, just as an example, if they had $85,000 of tax payments in 20 and 100 in the respective 2019 period, that would bring a 29% decline and make them eligible for the program that we have outlined. Um, the potential grant payments by category for Lake Bluff, so this lists um, the dollar values for the group in each um, state SIC category from automotive to hardware supplies, and garden materials, business services, construction, and some miscellaneous retail and eating and drinking places. And that's it, quick summary. Thank you, Bettina. Sure. So any thoughts from the committee or any other board members present regarding um, the program and what might um, participation look like? I've got a couple questions, uh, probably for Bettina. One, um, if we're doing March or April, uh, would the application period be the same, Grant, given that we haven't completed, I guess we will be completing April soon, but I'm sure they won't have their 
all the paperwork they need for uh, at least a, a period of time. So the reason we looked at March and April, if March is not a qualifying month because the order went into effect March 21st and they still had you know, a healthy business at that point, um, then they could wait and show us their April tax returns to qualify with, with that return Understood. to be rebated on the entire calendar year's 2019 payments. Okay. Okay. And, and what would be the, the time frame to get payments out to, to these businesses? So once the application is made, there's no reason it would need to be any longer than a normal two-week warrant period. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Maybe well, I, I think uh, I have... my question to you is, do you have a sense of the amount of businesses that would be um, covered by this program and to end uh, jointly, what would be the, I know that in your memo, there is an, uh, um, a budget of $71,000. What would be the, uh, would that be sufficient or would that, uh, what would be the coverage? What would be the financial exposure for example? So the exposure um, number that we calculated in the memorandum is based on the confidential sales tax information that the village has obtained. So those are based on actual dollars that we know were payments. And so that's how I calculated the exposure. Now, perhaps all those businesses may not apply um, for some reason. They may not um, want to go through the process or may not see value to it because their numbers could be too small. Um, so the number could be a little less but it shouldn't be any higher than the number that was calculated. Got it, thank you. Mm -hmm. A couple comments, uh, I'll go now. Uh, first, to thank you to uh, the people who put this together. I think that's uh, Barbara and Bettina and Drew. Um, I, I find this very impressive. You've done it uh, quickly and you've done something that at least to me makes a lot of sense. So a lot of thanks for that. Um, a couple comments or questions, the first of it is, um, to Drew or Bettina, are we sacrificing anything else to implement this, or is this being funded from a reserve? How are we funding this, Drew or Bettina? Well, we, we talked about that um, last week, Barbara and Bettina and I. We, we looked at the current, um, I'm sorry, the, the, the budget that you look to adopt tonight, there is a contingency fund of $200,000 there. So the idea is um, we, we, we presume that it would come from that line item there, which is not spoken for or earmarked, but is certainly limited in dollars. But that's, that's where we saw it coming from. So the short answer is I can't tell you with 100% certainty what else would be coming along in you know, a 12-month period. There's, that's why their contingency fund is always there to account for those things that we don't foresee. We certainly didn't plan on this when we put together the budget. So um, that's what we would look to, though, to answer your question. Okay, so that means we're taking less than 50% of our $200,000 contingency funds to fund this, correct? That's the plan. Very good. Uh, well, with that, I think you've answered my questions, and uh, I would uh, wholeheartedly support this and recommend it to the full board. I think the, the one thing that I am concerned about, though, is that perhaps maybe we should look at uh, a second round earlier than six months from now. I know that makes the accounting a little bit easier to, to do it uh, in November, but um, even if even if a, a business gets five thousand dollars, that doesn't seem like a, a whole lot of help over a, a six month period. So, I wonder if there isn't something that we could do maybe uh, quarterly to to reassess this and see if we might want to want to do some more. I'd I'd be happy to look at it again June fifteenth. We're basically right past April 15th now, maybe June or July 15th. I think, I think that makes sense, easy. Aaron, and that's a good point. Yep, I, I, I would agree with that. June or, June or July, I think, would be appropriate. I, I agree with that. Mark Dewart, do we have any thoughts to share on that? I think that this is an appropriate response. At this particular point in time, I think it's a comprehensive approach. Um, I think it's a responsive and responsible approach. So um, I think uh, uh, I, I would agree with the proposal to uh, take another snapshot um, and whatnot. And um, I think it's, uh, it, it's worthy of the board's consideration this evening. Mm -hmm. One thing to um, 
that I noted when comparing um, this program uh, with with other programs is that it definitely has um, a couple of things in mind. One being um, an ease in execution, so that um, you know staff really is uh, they have a brief application and also forms that. Um, the businesses would have to fill out anyway in terms of their sales tax. So we're not putting something onerous in front of the businesses, too many hoops to jump through to demonstrate what their need is. So I, I'm, I'm pleased that it has swift execution. We're not having the staff spend a lot of time um, and we're not requiring the businesses to spend a lot of time either to apply. Um, and also given the nature of either you can look at March or you can look at April and that two week turnaround, it's going to be pretty swift in terms of the receipt of that money. So um, we're going to be bringing help to the businesses in a very quick manner. Um, I do think there are a lot of moving pieces out there in terms of other programs. Um, and a, a lot of businesses have applied for things such as the payroll protection plan or grants or loans, and um, some have found out, some have not yet found out. And so in terms of what businesses will have for need, um, I think a lot of businesses just don't know at this point. And so leaving another quarter before we kind of see if we still have this current situation or if we have um, an uptick, um, you know, we can reevaluate it at that time. I, I think it makes um, a good deal of sense for us to do something uh, at this point in time, but um, revisiting at a later point in time and, and being able to see how we think the economy is doing um, is advisable. So I, I'm pleased to have us um, enter this onto the docket for discussion at a future finance committee meeting, probably in about three months, if that's what I'm hearing uh, from everyone. I'm going to suggest the earliest we revisit it would be July, in the mid-July, July 15th. That will give the village itself a chance to look and see how the village revenues are panning out with this and will give us a better idea of where things may or may not be going. Mm -hmm. I agree. We, we all have um, our hearts in the right place. We, and we also want to, um, you know, demonstrate real support for the local business community because it's their sales tax revenue that in fact helps to um, reduce the burden on our own residents and their, their property tax payments. So it really is something that's hopefully going to help the businesses, which it's going to help the village, which is going to help the residents. Um, but we don't want to move so quickly that we've committed um, without really understanding the full impact. So I agree we ought to wait and um, perhaps in a July timeframe, we mm -hmm. might revisit. I think that would be a better chance for us to update on all sides how this is going. Mm -hmm. Chair Anchorman? Yes. I have three emails that I could read if that would be the timing is good. good. Yes. And then uh, Glenn can see if anybody on the, uh, any of the attendees mm -hmm. want to comment. So the first one is received from um, this morning at 8.39 a.m. from Jeff Urso. Um, it is, uh, it reads, Dear President O'Hara, members of the board, Drew and Cole, <coughs> I want to express my gratitude for agenda item four, local stimulus grant program being discussed this evening. I thank you for your leadership on discussing this last meeting through public comment, which in part led to both Lake Forest passing a similar program and the county board adding this item to their agenda. In Lake Bluff, in addition to having the 8% sales tax rate similar to Lake Forest, we have an additional 1% special restaurant sales tax. I encourage the board this evening to consider allowing restaurants to keep the entire 1% special tax via grant or rebate for the remainder of 2020. This would inject capital into every restaurant currently operating and help the ones that open back up during phase one get back on their feet. President O'Hara and members of the board, your leadership is keeping everyone safe with the all in program and putting this in place more than a week ahead of the state. I know the same logic applied to businesses will keep doors open and everyone working. Restaurants and other retail establishments help generate income for villages and cities through sales tax, property tax, through our rent, licenses, and fees. Taking action tonight to make sure we are all here to continue to generate income for years to come. 
This is a great investment this evening. The National Restaurant Association predicts that 15 to 20% of all restaurants will close permanently as a direct result of the pandemic. And that number will continue to rise. I say not in our village through public and private partnerships, including grants, fundraisers, innovative business practices and other tools. We will keep our restaurants open for business throughout this pandemic and set an example throughout the North Shore how this little village does big things. I commend you uh, on your leadership this evening. Thank you on behalf of the Lake Bluff restaurants and retail businesses, Jeff Urso, founder of Donati's Pizza. He also had another comment that he chimed in on um, while the meeting was going on talking about the, pan, uh, the plan requiring a 20% loss uh, uh, of revenue. He said most restaurants have um, hit that threshold, but many of us have raised a lot in gift cards that will be counted, but not be in revenue in the future. Please take that into account. So he, um, and I, I don't know if he wants to chime in on that later or again, um, he's on the call, I believe. Um, there was another email submitted by um, Joanna Rolek, who is the head of the Lake Forest, Lake Bluff Chamber of Commerce. Joanna writes, Dear Village President O'Hare and members of the Village Board, on behalf of the Chamber of Board of Directors, I would like to relay our support for the approval of the proposed small business grant program, a valuable step toward assisting many of our local businesses in their recovery and economic sustainability as they come out of this current crisis. We recognize that there are sectors of our local economy that will not be eligible as they do not generate sales tax. While we would love to see all businesses supported, we understand there are economic challenges to expanding the scope of this support. In addition to the proposed monetary relief, we would also respectfully request consideration of a review of the list of non-essential businesses to allow additional businesses the opportunity to provide their services to the community within appropriate health guidelines. We ask that this be done at the earliest opportunity as there are many who have been re required to cease all operations and their continued existence is of concern. We thank you for your leadership and support. Please look to the chamber to continue to be of assistance to you in every possible way. It is our goal to work alongside our beloved business community and citizens with initiatives to rally support behind a healthy and vibrant Lake Bluff. With our sincere thanks, Joanna. Again, she's the executive director of the Lake Forest Lake Bluff Chamber of Commerce. Thank you. And those are the comments. Did you say there were three? Because I, I had Jeff Urso and Joanna Rolek. Jeff had two. Jeff was the okay. other person chiming in with the specificity about having uh, generated a good amount of revenue to those gift cards and that may implement or inhibit their ability to qualify or others. Right. right. So I, Glenn, do you I have, have anybody? A question. Raising? Okay. I just have a question uh, about the 1% um, that Jeff was talking about the 1% tax in Lake Bluff. What, what revenue do we generate annually, Bettina, from that 1% tax? So it's about $150,000. 150. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any, any further thoughts on the comments read from um, the emails received? And Glenn, I don't know if there's anybody waiting to ask a question. It doesn't look like it. Uh, there does not appear to be. Again, if you'd like to chime in, you haven't already at the bottom. There's a Q&A that you can use to be recognized, or if you're on the phone, you can dial star nine, star and the number nine um, will signal that you'd like to talk. And uh, we do have somebody. <laughs> You are on the air. Thank you, and thank you all. This is Joanna Rolick with the Chamber of Commerce. I really do appreciate, you know, on behalf of the Chamber, as we stated, we really do appreciate this consideration. We sent this out to our businesses today, and there were a couple of questions that came up from the businesses that I wanted to share with you. <coughs> One is, the under the possible conditions to consider incorporating in the program one of them say, states that the applicants must have been in operation as of march 21st 2020 that means that they are an operating business not that they were doing business is that correct because most of the businesses had closed so that's just clarification on that so they just had to be a business by that date correct that's how it was drafted yes Good. And then the second question was regarding the sales tax information and will that information that is submitted remain confidential? Can I speak to that? Yes, please. So I, the intent is that it remain confidential. There, however, would be the opportunity that someone could do some math and back into um, a sales tax number given that our payments are public on a warrant list. 
Okay, good. Thank you. Sure. Those are my two questions. Thank you so much. And again, thank you very much for this. Thank you. Are there any more uh, questions or comments from the board members? Well, with respect to um, with respect to what we're uh, proposing tonight and um, the nature of the contingency fund that we have, it seems like um, some of the concerns that people have, uh, you know, if this program is large enough um, and if um, specifically Mr. Urso had said if people are using um, gift cards, then perhaps when things open up, those gift cards would be used and revenue may not be as high as um, as previously uh, expected that it would now that businesses are open. Uh, if we choose to extend it, then at that point in time, um, that reduction in revenue would be, you know, recognized. But I, I do think it's important that we not commit to um, having the program extend. I think we should commit to looking at it again uh, in July, based on what I'm hearing from the board members, is that correct? That's that's my feeling as well. <clears throat> I think, like you said, I think uh, that that uh, decrease in revenue from the gift cards could be um, could be easy to uh, if we do another stimulus package, then that that would be the time to address it. Yeah, yeah. I agree with <laughs> the both of you. I think it makes sense, Barbara and Aaron. Mm -hmm. And just to clarify, right now the way that this this is set up. The the, um, the draft form would would receive and accept applications through October 31st. So the idea if somebody had a, a a month with other alternative revenues that they usually don't count on that could inflate that particular month, they could apply again another month if it's still experiencing the difficulty and may hit the threshold at a later date up until October 31st. The way that's designed right now. But it's not a cumulative where each month that you have a 25% or greater downtick, you can get 10%. It's a one-time qualification at this point. That's right. If, okay. if, if, if that person saw a lot of, uh, let's say, use a restaurant, uh, if there were, happened to be a calzone restaurant that hit, uh, had a lot of alternate revenue sources in the month of April, but they didn't in May, you know, they may be, be able to apply and qualify in May and for that one month, one-time payment. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Uh, Regis, did you? Yes. Mm -hmm. I have a question for you that is, you said that would be a program that would be uh, reconsidered on a quarterly basis. That means that that might be occurring three times this year. And uh, your budget is about 200, I believe, for that uh, contingency fund. And you're spending about 70 right now. So you might actually run out of money uh, before the end of the year, if I do my math correctly. Well, what we have outlined now is a 10% rebate with one-time participation. You can apply, and if you qualify, you could receive that. If you receive it in April, and then you also don't have uh, that same level of revenue in May or June, you've already obtained your, your rebate at this point. But what about in July? In July, if we look at it and we want to do something different, we could do that, but we're not committing to repeating that. It may be that we are committing to extending the period for application beyond October. Okay. Um, you know, we can, we can discuss how we might alter the program, but we're not saying that we're doing the same program again with the same businesses qualifying. It may be that we just extend the period and then those businesses that had not previously qualified, they may now qualify. Thank you. I think that um, uh, specification was missing. Thank you. Yeah, we could probably uh, highlight that and underscore that a one-time payment, make that crystal clear in the documents. Right. Mm -hmm. right. I, had a, I had a really quick question just about how we determine um, that threshold, the 10%, not the threshold, I'm sorry, but the 10% mm -hmm. uh, for the rebate. Was there any discussion on that or, I mean, I'm clearly it has to do with how much money we wanted to give out. Um, but did we discuss any other percentages there or was it? 
Um, we have not heard anybody suggest a, another number. Um, do we have any thoughts on that? I think the conversation that we had, Joy, that where we, how we landed on that number was trying to be comfortable with the amount, the total amount of dollars allocated towards the program. And then that, that helped shape the percentage. Okay, thanks. You look at what our maximum exposure is and what we have in terms of our contingency fund and then see what, what the program might look like. There. Right, okay. you might see, we don't wanna throw a number out there and then when it all gets, you know, flow through all the, the numbers, it's larger than what we have a contingency fund. Allocated. Account. Right. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. It may be that a business would self-eliminate too. You, you, don't, you know, they have to apply. Right. They have to say, I need it. I need this. I think that the money that the village is going to provide for me is going to be a game changer. And so I'm willing to do it. Is it, Bettina, is it, um, is the, the grant or the rebate, is that considered um, taxable income then for the business? Yes, it is. They'd get a 1099 at the end of the year if the qualifying amount was over $600. Okay. And the minimum amount that it would have to be would be $500 or more. We didn't want to start issuing checks for $12. You know, it's right. just not efficient use of anyone's time. So there was that minimum threshold. Just to add a couple more bits of information for you, um, if it's all right, Chair Ankerman. Yes, please. So I had a couple of conversations with other local businesses who had reviewed the Village's program on our website and were um, complimentary and supportive of the program. The threshold limit that came up, the 25% threshold, um, I think I, I had spoken with, a, I spoke with a restaurateur previously during the Village's conversations um, with them over relaxing the um, liquor licensing regulations. And they had indicated very early that they were seeing a 40% dip. I guess I'm somewhat pleased to report that the, the dip wasn't as low as they thought that they actually were closer to 25% reduction in revenues, which is a heck of a lot better than 40% reduction. And they felt like they would still qualify. So they were comfortable with that number. I also heard from um, another uh, retail establishment that commented that they were about 25% as well down. So um, that number seemed to be a, a number that was making sense to the, the business community. I know um, Mr. Urso has raised a concern specifically um, about the um, revenue attached to the gift cards. He actually posted another question about it and I, I felt like that you guys understood that. And I suggested that he chime in if he felt differently or wanted to clarify that. So I just wanted to relay that. I just want to make a comment on the gift cards. I, I think it would be great if somebody, if a business does not qualify because they're being supported by the community buying, buying gift cards, right? As long as that continues. I understand the concern that um, down the road that, that might affect their, their revenue uh, in the future. Um, but I, isn't it wonderful that the community is supporting those businesses so much that um, by, by buying gift cards and, and keeping money coming into the door. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to um, discourage the community from continuing to buy those dis those uh, gift cards um, just to make the businesses qualify for the, for this uh, stimulus. So um, everybody keep buying them and, and uh, we'll, we'll address the, the revenue shortfall at a later date, I hope. That's Can I great. ask a question for mm -hmm. clarification purposes? Mm -hmm. So if we're looking at line 25 of the state um, return, that would be the sales tax payment amount and are gift cards taxable? Um, if, if we're using the decline in sales tax payments from month to month, I'm not sure that a gift card purchase would interfere with the taxable sales amount. That's a very good question, Bettina. And I suppose as a gift card, uh, does the money get taxed and go into the system until it's spent? would be another way of articulating that. Mm -hmm. So it, it may be that uh, what Mr. Urso has achieved is actually a form of financing. Starbucks is well known for doing this. He's achieved a form of financing and he doesn't have to pay the tax on it until later if that mm -hmm. works as I think mm -hmm. perhaps we think it does. Right. 
So if the program is to look at um, the tax line 25, which is the tax payment and not the revenues, um, it wouldn't include that number for the qualifications in the months of March or April. Thank you. Is, I don't know if Peter is um, going to look <laughs> up some information um, regarding that specific issue. Peter, were you looking up um, information specific to that issue of <laughs> sales tax? The gift cards, are they included in the calculation of sales tax if someone purchases it? Would the business owner include that as part of what sales tax gets calculated on? I was not looking it up. <laughs> okay. Was, so what we could do, um, if it's, so if we could, we could, the, you guys can make a recommendation to the full board to consider this as written. And yeah. then between now and the first meeting in May, if you needed to revisit this, you, there's time, the board's going to meet in May, at, you know, the second Monday and have a chance to revisit this. If, if, if there's a, a clarification or some information becomes revealed from the Department of Revenue and having a chat and following up on that clarity. I think that sounds like a great idea. It also um, will probably wash out in terms of uh, revisiting this in three months because those, hopefully those gift cards would be used uh, sometime between now and then and uh, it would be recognized as revenue, not twice, but once at either one of those periods of time, so. We'll check it out. We'll check it out, okay. So um, we had a, a motion to consider this program. We had um, discussion uh, regarding um, the program as outlined um, and as far as I can tell, I don't think we have any, any updates to the program, but we have a recommendation to revisit um, the program in three months to see if this is something that we want to um, address in some way, whether it be um, a continuation in terms of an eligibility period or um, some additional incentives. Uh, so at this it, point, it, it, go ahead. The only thing I would just clarify, I thought there was one point that was raised about clarifying that it was a one-time opportunity during this yes. one time. Yes. Just to make that bold and underlined. Yes. In size yes. 30 font. Yes. Yes. And, and the application for this would be something that um, businesses could do online, a, a one-page type application, and then submitting the related uh, sales tax forms as kind of a, a, a backup or verification of the numbers that are being input, would that be, uh, Bettina, how we would uh, propose to execute this with an online application or it's something that people would have to? <clears throat> so we can create a, an online fillable PDF that they could, you know, submit with an email address to send it to and, but they need to include their backup documentation. So we could work through a um, hybrid, somewhat electronic process, sure. Okay. All right then. So do we need to, um, have a voice vote then, or a, actually a roll call vote then, in terms of this plan? Um, I, I'm trying to re review my notes, and maybe Marlene can help me here, in terms of having a motion to recommend approval to the village board. I don't know if that exact motion was made. It, it wasn't really made. Okay. It was, um, <clears throat> it was just said that, um, everybody said they agreed to it, but there was really no, Motion made. Okay. Okay. So I guess I'll make it. Motion made. <laughs> okay. There we okay, go. Okay. Thank you. Second. All in favor? Or do we need uh, to do the voice vote? Uh, the roll, roll call, call vote. Sure. Okay. Trustee Toll. Aye. I should say Member Toll. Um, Member Meyer. Aye. And Chair Ankerman. Aye. So there you go. All right. Motion carries. All right. I'm going to go back to my agenda and see what else we have here. Um, informational items. Is there anything in addition to what we've just discussed for a staff report? Um, well, and Bettina may want to jump in here, but I, the only thing I would say is, you know, um, tonight is um, the budget um, hearing is continued this evening. This board has made a change to our budget plan that was 
after the, the finance committee had originally recommended a document, we hit the COVID-19 nightmare that we've been living in. And um, we made some adjustments in terms of um, anticipating revenue shortfalls as well as offsetting expenditures to try to cushion um, so that uh, cushion ourselves for the anticipated uh, revenue, revenue declines. And um, I, having conversations with Bettina about this earlier today, there, there are many organizations that at this late or 11th hour in a budget process chose to do nothing, adopt the plain, the plain budget that they adopted, and then come back and revisit this. I think this body has been uh, proactive in addressing um, some of these issues as murky as they are, but um, knowing that we're going to keep updating as the information becomes more available to us and sharing it with you all on the full board, but also um, sharing um, what we see are um, there's going to be times during the budget. Um, well, I should say there'll be times during this upcoming fiscal year where we'll bring projects to you, and mostly there'll be large capital initiatives. While you've approved a number number of them, there'll be others that'll come along that will give you information on saying, do you want to pull the trigger on this? Yes or no? Given that the best outlook of revenue may be worse or better than we thought, and try to help shape those decisions. It will not be easy. Right? Mm -hmm. There'll be some storm sewer projects I'm thinking of that are significant dollars that are very close to being put out to bid. And when those go out, then you'll be, we can, if you have a preference before we go out to bid, we can, we can say, hey, do you want us to bid this at all? Or do you want to hit the, you want to wait till fall? So we can have, it'd be nice to get some direction about that now. If you feel like you would like to see some of those um, projects go ahead and go out to bid and test the market and see where the numbers are, or if you want to wait, um, and do it again in the fall and rebid it when we have a, maybe a better idea of you know, the depth and breadth of this economic downturn. I've got a comment on that, Drew. Um, yeah. I know in the past we've had kind of a priority list uh, as far as what the most important and most pressing projects are um, mm -hmm. in capital improvement. Is that something that you and, and maybe Jeff could put together for us for the next budget year to say, these are the things that we really can't push back in, for another year? And then maybe there's something that could wait another year or, or two. I think that might be helpful um, if, if the time comes that we need to decide whether to do a, a project to, to know where, where it stands as far as you know, yeah. the sewers in imminent collapse or, or you know, something like that. Yeah, we can do that. And I'd say there's probably close to 400,000, a little more of dollars that are uh, capital dollars that are not um, pushing forward, you know, a lot of the big dollar items that have already been executed this year include the road fund support money, you know, which um, I think this board in the past has always continued to do every year because you don't want to get behind, right? This gets more and more expensive every year. So um, the, there was some, a minor sanitary sewer project and the other projects have been water fund, right? So the, the big projects this year, you'll have a chance to weigh in and we can go back and look at those and reprioritize them. Some of them are fleet um, and, and probably could wait. Um, and others are um, projects that just haven't been done, have been prioritized over time, and they finally made it into the budget, you know. So um, do you pull the trigger? Or you can, can you wait another six months? You probably could. Um, does that, um, but we, we can help prioritize those. And then even looking into the next fiscal year, there's other um, opportunities for the village to soften the blow. Like if you recall, when, when we amended the, the budget plan to, um, reverse the general transfer. fund, yeah, mm -hmm. the transfer from the general fund to the vehicle re equipment replacement funds. We only recommended that for the first part, for the part one, the first fiscal year of the two-year budget. We didn't do it for the second year, so we still have that. And, and Bettina, remind me the dollar figure associated with that. So the budget shows one hundred eighty thousand dollars for that, and it also shows a five hundred thousand tra dollar transfer to capital. So there's there's a, there's more money out there. So um, there's more more cushioning for a soft landing that still exists within the numbers that we can do and still do the other capital initiatives. But we can help shape that up and, and help that as we get closer to doing those projects. We certainly can do that. Mm -hmm. um, certainly before the July meeting of the next month, but we can we can meet before then and, and have a better a better idea of of like here here's the things in the next 24 months that we think are going to happen because some of these things probably aren't going to happen, but not because of the village is doing, but because either A, it's an IDOT permit that we're waiting on that's probably not going to happen. I'm thinking Green Bay Road here, right, and the bridge. Right. 
um, and some other projects, like maybe this other bridge, we're still waiting for an IDOT approval for the pedestrian bridge over 176. So some of these things keep getting pushed back, not by the village's choice, but by others. Right. So. Right. Um, Regis, you had a comment you'd like to share? Yes, I'd like to. Um, uh, Drew and I had a conversation today where we had basically the same conversation where if we're in trouble, what can we delay or what can we postpone for the year and providing us a cushion uh, for next year. There's another tool we have that is on Bettina's uh, presentation, the our general fund for how it sheds out for 21 and 22, basically, and how that is basically established as a trend going forward. And so it would be very useful. It's like the, the canary in the, in the coal mine, that is, if we see that trend going down, this is like a differential, a mathematical differential going down, uh, going up or down in the future. If we see that, you know what, that doesn't look re really good. We could address it and basically correct the situation ahead of time. So the, the thing I was telling Drew would be that it would be very useful to have basically the same graph as it's pretty much every month or on a, on a very regular basis to see how we fare as a as a board in the community to see where our cash flow is. So you're saying let's just look at all of our all the revenues that are coming in and the timing of the cash flow to have that direct us. Exactly, right. and knowing how the Bettina's uh, trend, Bettina's um, um, approximation of how 21 or 22 mm -hmm. is going to be, given that trend to see how we collect revenue in the community and how we basically have lined up expenses to see if we should um, uh, correct expenses or adjust expenses or delay expenses or right. how we should behave basically. Right. And uh, I'm sure Bettina will be providing data to us in terms of how we're doing on, on uh, collections of revenues. I can include something that's more um, fund balance focused in the monthly reports, especially as we start collecting that revenue. Mm -hmm. As it stands right now, the governor's put extensions on sales tax payments for um, retail, you know, for businesses. So we're looking at a, an additional 60 to 90 day delay on top of the original two to three month lag. So we probably won't be getting April receipts until at least July. Um, um, so that will have a you know effect on cash flow as that those delays come into play, and we also don't know what the county will do with property tax um, payments if they roll out a delay for or if they allow people to pay late without penalty, then mm -hmm. those those payments that are escrowed potentially could come through all in September and not in the earlier period. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What kind of liability does that put us? Of how much money, let's say those two, if those two plans were coming to fruition, in, from a cash flow standpoint, we could be assured by a couple of millions at, this, at the end of the day. Well, we do have, you know, fund balances, we do. right, Bettina? Yes. Right. There, so there is reserve that would cover, you know, half of the levy payment if it were late until we actually received it. Um, the concern or consideration would be, would we need to provide assistance to anyone else in that process that doesn't have those reserves. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot and of moving. Just, and just to, you want to be clear, that's the conversation clear. is like, like other, other agencies, sister agencies or sub- uh, Other component, component units. Government, the library, right? right? The library is completely been uh, relying upon property taxes. Right. Now, if those numbers get delayed, and, and bear in mind, they have not contacted us about this, they have, but this is just some, just trying to, Passing through alternative scenarios, mm -hmm. what could happen, right? Mm -hmm. So, right. so we've we've done some preparation in terms of making our reserve balances larger to anticipate potential snags, just like that. Revenues not coming in or delayed. Um, so we've we've actually positioned ourselves to address some of that. Um, we just don't know the extent to which we're going to be called on for those reserves. So. Um, you know, kudos to Bettina and Drew figuring out how to how to make those dollars available for you know a time such as this. Mm -hmm. So and hopefully be able to continue doing the capital investment that you wanted to do, right? That's the goal. Exactly. exactly. And I think in my experience, the tools that Bettina and Drew are putting in front of us are great, where we can really think ahead uh, to see how we want to behave uh, financially speaking. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Oh.
outside of the library, is there any other agency that we that might be affected um, that we might have to be concerned about? Well, like, I mean, like that would be significant. A significant. Well, I would say yeah. The biggest probably. Well, there's two projects and they one of them fell to the cutting room floor we talked about it was the seventy five thousand dollar contribution to the senior housing that's more of a project not an entity but that's a joint agency the senior housing right the senior resource commission right. project right mm -hmm. but as far as another governmental entity perhaps is the village has been asked to participate in the um financing of um the beach improvements to right. help shore up that um asset of the of the communities and the exact number is not been defined um, and where that is as a, a and so everybody understands this is that there was a joint committee that made up of village um, representatives i'll say as well as park district representatives um, former village board member paula mew was the chair joy was on that committee um, the idea was to try to find a best pass I'm sorry, best pass sorry i can't say it best path forward to um, recommend what type of um, what type and um, prioritize the armaments of the shoreline and um, right now the status of that is, is the park district consultant bill weaver from aecom has submitted a letter to um, former executive mm -hmm. Ron Salsky and myself that has been transmitted to the North Shore Water Reclamation District of, um, of all the litany of improvements and the expectation that there is a significant amount of cost participation by the North Shore Water Reclamation District, which we think will kick off a conversation and back and forth between the park district, um, the village to a, a lesser degree and um, the North Shore Water Reclamation District, but that's that is a, a, a big number. Um, you know, the, the total outlay for all those is north of five million dollars to do all those improvements, mm -hmm. and so um, that's that's probably the biggest one that somebody could come to the village and, and look for village participation. And and and, and enjoy you were at those meetings. I, I I tried to temper expectations of the park district at those meetings for village participation, given that the village occupies you know village residents are, are members of the park district so you know why should maybe they consider paying twice if you will you know the idea of participating to some degree um, as part of the district and then again as the village within that smaller footprint may be problematic for the board to to you know get their arms around but that would well, probably i think go ahead. I, I was just gonna say i think i remember for that the, the idea was to go to the water reclamation district first see if we could get the as much money as we could and get started with them and then trying to fill in the gaps uh it would it would be kind of a staged process you know that's pr right um, process it wouldn't just be like all of a sudden we'd be shelling out a huge amount of money um but there's nothing else there's nothing else from the standpoint of like when we say the library who's wholly dependent we don't really have anything else kind of sitting out there like that like i like i get it's not really a liability but something that we would have to help and be responsible for an agency kind of thing not that I can think of, Bettina. You any others? Can you think of anything, Bettina? No, I can't. Mm -mm. Okay. And, and just to give you a sense of the, um, the library, the portion of the levy that was is the library is the total for the year is nine hundred and fifty-seven thousand. So half of that would be um, the initial payment that could be okay. deferred. Thank you. Thanks. Sure. Um, Getting back to where we were earlier uh, in terms of we had a motion to discuss, but we did not have uh, a, a recommendation from the committee yet. Is that right? No, that that has been done. And okay. There's been a vote taken. You got that. Got it. So we're all set. Yep. Okay. Uh, that's right. We're on the informational and staff report. Yep. I think. I think that's it. If we have no other, um, Mark, did you have something you were going to say? No, nope. I'm okay. good. All right. So um, I don't see any more comments or any hands raised. Glenn, do you? No, sir. Okay. Okay. So do we have, uh, is it appropriate at this time to entertain a motion to adjourn? Yes, ma'am, it is.
So moved. Thank Second. you. Thank All in you. favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, that means we'll see everybody at uh, 7 p.m. Very good. Good night. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. Thank you. <laughs>